All right. Good morning, Brookside. How are we doing? Uh, good morning, all of you who are watching online. It's really good to have you guys with us today. Uh, welcome to Brookside Church. We hope you enjoy your experience today, and we hope that uh, you will be blessed and encouraged by it. I'm up here with my friend and partner in ministry, Josh King. He's our youth pastor, and uh, we've been starting uh, over the period of Lent, we've been starting these prayer opportunities where we as a church can really join together and pray to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship and to fall under the authority of the word and so forth. Um, and today um, is, is a little bit of a unique experience. Let, let me kind of preface it if I could. Um, I've been noticing an increased, uh, I think frustration, if I could say it that way, that the community and perhaps the world has regarding the church as a whole. I think there's a perception out there uh, that the world thinks that we Christians, we kind of get together in our holy huddles, we sing kumbaya a little bit, um, we share with each other our feelings, and we do it all in these church buildings, and we kind of isolate ourselves from the rest of the world and really disengage from the reality of the world's pain and brokenness. And it's not just like on an individual basis, it's kind of on a national basis too. Uh, something happened this week, um, and I'm going to have Josh talk about that in a little bit, and it happened in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's so far away, it's so easy for us to, well, stay disengaged because, well, that's not our people down there and that's not who we're around. So we can kind of disengage from it all. But part of the gospel is that as followers of Jesus, our mission field is not just Fort Wayne, it's the world. And so when there's brokenness all over the world, part of our responsibility is to engage it with the gospel as much as we're able to. And part of that is through prayer, hence the reason that we've started this prayer opportunity. So, um, Josh, I know you, you feel that same. We've had several conversations like this, but talk to us a little bit about what happened uh, this week in Atlanta and, and why it's so heavy on your heart as, as it is for so many. Yeah, so if you guys um, were in tune in the news, actually my family has just moved to Atlanta, so they are very uh, close to what happened in the situation. Um, I've also got to talk to different people, friends, family, community, um, in the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Uh, in this last week, something terrific, or sorry, like horrible, horrible happened um, within that community. And if you guys don't know, the hate crimes um, and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, has gone up significantly um, over the past couple years. Um, one, this is an incident that is so shameful uh, and so hurtful. This is an act of terror. Um, against this specific community. And while the authorities say that it was sexually motivated, um, it does not discount what has happened. Uh, and we have the names of the people um, listed up on the screen. And we, we're doing this not because we're trying to do a PR stunt or we're trying to make ourselves look good, but we deeply, deeply empathize with this community. Um, I have talked to several different people in this community and they are hurting. Um, when you see yourself on the screen and you see faces, um, when you've been targeted, uh, particularly for ethnicities or whatever reasons, um, for being women, for being men, for being a minority, um, you feel that pain deeply. Um, and so for my brothers and sisters in the Asian and Pacific Islander community, we love you. Um, we deeply empathize with you. I am praying for you constantly. Um, we've had some conversations, I've had some conversations with people, and we don't want to negate what has happened because the gospel says that it is for all people. Um, and the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom that looks so multi-ethnic um, that is involving so many different people, race, tongue, culture, creed. Um, we truly believe that here. So um, if you guys would stand to me, I just want to pray um, for the victims and their families. Um, the shooter himself, because his soul um, hangs in the balance as well. And while we don't overlook his actions, um, we do realize that he did take a big part of someone's life away. He did decide to strip someone of their humanity, and he did decide to commit a sin against brothers and sisters, people um, who God has clearly said, like, you are made in my own image. So would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you so much just for who you are. Um, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one where it says God came down in the flesh to die 
for us. He went to this cross obediently for us so that we may no longer live in sin or shame or guilt, but we now can live in freedom because of what he has done for the cross. And Lord, we pray for the victims in Atlanta, God, and what they're experiencing. And I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, couldn't get it off my, my brain and just what has happened, how horrific it is to know that your last moments were stared down the barrel of a gun. God, we don't pick sides or we don't try to, to, to make light of this, but we fully empathize with our friends and family and community in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. God, I pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hands and feet to be open, to be able to come in solidarity with this community, Father. The gospel is not just about a news that's just going to save our souls. It's about bringing the kingdom of heaven here to earth now. So we thank you for these things. We thank you for the ability to gather today to worship you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
You know, sometimes uh, I can go through my week and I can go through a day and realize, you know what? I haven't really thought about Jesus much. I don't know about you guys, but there's just some days, some weeks that we try to do it on our own. Um, This week I was reading through Deuteronomy, and it says this in chapter 4. It says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And I just had to stop because I think so often as believers, we can get in this rhythm where we forget the gospel because we think the gospel is for somebody else. It's for reaching people. The gospel's for me. The gospel's for you. Let us not grow tired or weary of hearing the gospel because it is all about Jesus. Everything we do is for Jesus. And I don't want to be a person that lives through my life like the Israelites, that God provides for me one moment and the next moment I'm saying, God, do you even care about me? I want to remember the things that God has done for me. I don't want to forget those things. And I just just want to take a moment right now and just rest. Rest in this, uh, this moment and just begin to remember the things that God has done for you. Maybe you walked in this morning and you're feeling a little down, you're feeling tired, you're feeling weary. Just take a moment and just reflect on the things that God has done in your past and he will be faithful to do today and in your future.
that we would commit today and you chose to die for us anyway. Lord, let us never grow tired, never grow weary of preaching the gospel to ourselves because it's the very gospel in our lives that is power to love those around us, to worship you, God. We just thank you so much this morning for your love. We pray this in your son's name. You may be seated. Praise God um, for his marvelous love and beauty in the midst of darkness. There's hope for us through Jesus, and we can look forward to that glorious day in the new kingdom where we get to run and dance and love freely um, with Christ. Um, reigning over us as the true and only king. That's such good news. I'm so pumped. Um, But we get to do this thing called church, which is a small glimpse of what we'd be able to experience in eternity. And so um, we'll have to settle for this right now in our brick and mortar building uh, that looks like Mario Dungeon Level 5. But we love it. We love it. We love it. Um, But yeah, I'm so glad to be here with you guys, uh, my family, my community, uh, and yeah, we've got a couple of announcements for you guys. So Good Friday is coming up here soon. Good Friday is coming up here soon. April 2nd, my goodness, this year is passing by so fast. And we will actually have child care available. Um, so if your child was just born um, or is five years old, but if he's six years old or she's six years old, I'm sorry, you're going to have to take him with you. Um, but no, we will have child care for you guys so you parents can come and enjoy and worship with us. Um, I'm super excited for this. Um, I think it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be really powerful. Um, And as we're preparing and as we're celebrating Good Friday, Easter um, is coming up too as well. We get to celebrate the death and resurrection of King Jesus. Um, And I like to call that like the Super Bowl of the Christian calendar. So that's the biggest, just biggest day of the year where we celebrate our King's resurrection. And there will be children's ministry that day. But take note, there'd only be children's ministry at 11 a.m. So if you come at 9 a.m. expecting children's ministry, you will be disappointed. So mark that down, check the calendar, check the website. Um, There will be children's ministry happening only at 11 a.m. And last thing, uh, it's always weird uh, when I first start working at church to talk about giving because it's like, hey, man, um, I need your money to do this thing. Uh, <laughs> it's like, otherwise we can't do anything. Uh, so we need your money uh, to be able to do the ministries that we get to do here and really just be able to preach the gospel and talk to people and take people out to lunch and coffee and have good conversations. And so if you feel it in your heart to give give generously. There's no cap. There's no limit. There's no minimum. It's just what you feel the Lord has placed in your heart to give, because that's how we get to do the things that we get to do here. Um, If this is your first time here at Brookside um, and you call, you want to call your fit, this family, your home, um, make sure you think, come see me or Eric or Yule or anybody to get connected so that you don't have to walk Um, this life alone, because we want to do life and community and family with you. So um, let's go ahead and just get our hearts and minds ready for the scriptures, um, the good news of Jesus, 
the gospel. Um, and let's just get ready for Eric, whatever he has for us today. I'm going to pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much um, just for who you are. Um, thank you that Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God's glory that has been manifested so that we may see the invisible God face to face. And God, we thank you that we no longer have to question or, or wonder like, man, what is God like? All we have to do is look to the icon, this man named Jesus. And Lord, I ask that we would open our hearts, that the Holy Spirit may be here and he dwells here now, that we're able to seek, hear, listen, and respond to what you have for us. We thank you for this time. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Um, if, if you haven't met me yet, if you're newer with us, let me just introduce myself again. My name is Eric Dubal, and I am very happy, as I am every week, to be the lead pastor of Brookside Church. And it really is a privilege of mine uh, to not just be a part of this church family, but to work with an incredible staff like Josh and you and the rest of the team, but also work with an incredible elder board too. I know, you, I know they're not the most upfront people. You might not even know who they are, but I want you to know uh, just in case you're wondering, the, the leadership of Brookside, I think, is in a very healthy place. And sometimes that's not true, even in churches. And I just want you to know, in case you're wondering, that, that we work well together, that we enjoy being with each other, and that we are more unified, more cohesive now as a leadership team than I think we've ever been before. And so <clears throat> let me introduce myself as I introduce the leadership to you. But uh, I want to say thank you for being with us again today. For those of you watching online, thanks for joining us in our online experience. While you're there, and for any of you right here, at any time, feel free to grab your app or or, uh, the website and cruise around and see what we have there. Get to know us, get to know our values, our vision, get to know our statements of faith, what we have to offer so that you can figure out the best place and the best way for you to dive into the life of Brookside because we really do believe, thank you, Josh, that um, you being a part of Brookside makes Brookside better. And you getting involved in Brookside makes this place better. You help us get to where God is calling us to go faster. So the invitation is before you and we would love for you to be a part of that, all right? Now, though, is a great time for you to open your Bibles. We're going to go to a couple places. In fact, let me just take you to where we're going to go shortly, and that is John chapter 2, okay? Go to John chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. You can open up the Bible app on your smartphone, or it's going to be on the screen. You can just follow along there as well. But let me just start by saying this. We are in week three of our series uh, leading up to Easter on April 4th. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of the last things that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross. Now, to give you the quick context that I've given you over the last couple of weeks, Jesus was on the cross from the time they nailed him there to the time he breathed his last breath for about six hours. And if you're in that much pain for six hours, you're really not gonna say a lot of things at all. But what you do say mean a whole lot and they mean a lot for us too. So as I've said the last couple of weeks, my prayer for you is that over the course of this series, you will deepen in your appreciation and love for Jesus and you'll deepen in your love for yourself. So that at the end of all of this, uh, we can each, wherever we are at with Jesus, grow closer in our relationship with him. That, that's our ultimate prayer. And the reason I want you to love yourself more is because if Jesus thought you were worth it to go to the cross, I think he probably wants you to think you're worth it too. Uh, and that it, and, and it, it's not merited based upon how our behavior, okay? It's merited based on the fact that he really, really loves us. Now, if you are on your deathbed, what you say is probably gonna be the most important things that you say. You're not gonna talk about trivial things that don't really matter. What you're gonna talk about are things that summarize who you are, your character, and talk about the most important things in your life. So if I knew I was on my deathbed, I'd tell my family how much I loved them and how proud I was of them. And then I would talk about Jesus. I'd say, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Keep your faith on him and never let anything steal your faith away. And that's, that's really my big prayer for my family right now, for my kids. So when I look at what Jesus said, the few things that he did say, I'm asking the question, all right, what does this tell me about the kind of God that we serve? What does this tell me about Jesus' nature? And then what does it tell me about myself? So if you were with us two weeks ago when we launched this series, we looked at the first thing Jesus said. He says, Father, forgive them for they just don't know what they're doing. 
And that meant a ton to me because I got to be honest with you, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm so grateful that there's a God who gives me grace regardless of my behavior. And I'm so grateful for that. And then last week, we looked at what Jesus said to the thief right next to him. He said, hey, I'll tell you the truth. I promise you today, you will be with me in paradise. And that shocked some of us because Jesus just gave this guy grace after only five minutes of faith. So really, are deathbed conversions legit? Or do you have to be a follower of Jesus for a long period of time before he gives you that kind of grace? And I got to tell you, I struggle with that because I'm thinking, listen, I'm glad Jesus has given him that grace and that forgiveness just as long as he gives me a little bit more, you know, because I've been a follower of Jesus longer, right? I've been a better person longer. So I think that's a struggle some of us had, but I think at the end of the day, man, we are so grateful, aren't we? That with a little bit of faith in Jesus, he gives us all of heaven. It's a beautiful picture. Today, here's what we're going to do. Let me tell you what's going on. Jesus is on the cross, right? And he sees all of these people in front of him. There's different kinds of people up there. There's the soldiers, right? These are the people who nailed him to the cross. They're there to ensure that he dies on the cross. There's also the Jewish religious leaders. The people for the last three years have been trying to accuse him, arrest him, and find a way to kill him. Well, they succeeded. They're there watching Jesus die on the cross because he was competition, something like that. And they're all sneering at Jesus, mocking him. And we talked about what they said over the last couple of weeks. And there's other people too. There's crowds that are walking by. Some are just like covering their eyes and walking by. They don't want to see that stuff. There's other people who are joining in the mockery. But then Jesus fixates his eyes on a couple of familiar faces. Five familiar faces, in fact. Four of them are women. And all of them are named Mary. That's not confusing at all. But let me tell you who a couple of these Marys are, right? One of these Marys is Mary Magdalene. She used to be a prostitute and then Jesus rescued her and she became a devoted follower of Jesus. She's been with him the entire time. The other Mary is his mother, his mother. There's another guy there too. His name is John. He's one of Jesus' disciples and perhaps strongest disciple. And if you ever read the gospel that bears his name, the book of John, you will sometimes see the author refer to the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, he's referring to himself. So it sounds a little bit arrogant to me, but at least that's, that's who he's referring to. So Jesus sees his mother and he sees John and he focuses his thoughts on them too. Now watch what he says to them. This is John 19, verse 26 and 27. He says this, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now, let me tell you part of why Jesus did this, okay? By this time, Jesus' father, Joseph, had already passed away. The Bible doesn't tell us when or what killed him, but he's out of the picture. And in that culture, widows, especially the age of Mary, the chances of taking care of herself are pretty much nil, all right? She's pretty much an outcast at this point. So it falls to the oldest son to take care of her. Well, that's Jesus. So however Mary needed to be taken care of, that fell on Jesus' plate. So if he had a home, she moved in with him. He would cover her expenses, so on and so forth. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but here's the problem, guys. He's on the cross right now. He doesn't have any more chance of taking care of his mother. So if he doesn't figure it out for her, honestly, she could be destitute. Destitute. So there's his friend, John, a disciple who a lot of Scholars believe is a full believer in Jesus at this point. You have to ask the question, you know, Jesus had four other brothers. Why weren't they there at the cross? And why didn't he give charge of his mother into their hands? That's another conversation. But for this point, he gives his mother into the care of John. 
The Bible says that he took her into his home. And what that means is that she went to live with him. He would care for her, provide for her, be the breadwinner for her. And you don't see it in the Bible, but a lot of scholars say, based on other sources, that she lived with John for the next few years in Jerusalem. But then John, at some point, went somewhere else to help plant a church. Mary went with him to help plant a church. And they some believe that she would actually die 11 years after Jesus was on the cross. But isn't it cool to think think that Jesus, his, I'm sorry, Mary, his mother, helped in this church planting mission that he started the church with. That is beautiful. So I'm asking the question again, guys, what kind of God do we have based upon what he said? Let me tell you where it gets difficult. The crucifixion and the resurrection is the pinnacle moment of God's entire redemptive plan. Scripture talks about how God put this redemptive, restorative plan from the beginning of time, right? And then when Adam and Eve, way back in Genesis, when they sinned, you know, by eating the forbidden fruit and stuff, that triggered God's redemptive plan to restore all of creation, all of history, and all of humanity back to him, to break the power of sin and to conquer sin and the grave and death. And all of that happened and was conquered on the cross and through the resurrection. So check this out. If there were ever a moment in Jesus' life to be laser focused on this massive mission of saving the universe and restoring all of creation, this is the moment. And in all honesty, as much as he loves his mother, he's like, listen, I got to focus right here. I got to save the universe. I can't be bothered with this little problem, but watch what he does. He takes his focus off of big picture and on to little problem. Man, is that important for us to know because a lot of us, we have problems, right? But in the grand scheme of things, really how big of a deal is it, you know? I mean, I've got this interview for my first job ever and it's at McDonald's and stuff and really in the grand scheme of things, it's not that huge of a deal, but it's a big deal to me, a big deal to me. And you know what? I've got this deadline. I've got this meeting. I've got this appointment, whatever it is. And you know what? Nobody else really knows about it or really cares about it. And it's honestly not that big of a deal. I'm still going to heaven if I die, right? No matter how this goes. So I wonder, is God really that concerned about this little problem? Now, here's what you have to understand. I think the reason that Jesus took his focus off of this grand mission and off of what the crowds were saying, off of all the mockery of the soldiers and the Jews and put it on Jesus is I think in that moment, he fully embraced his mother's pain. Let me tell you what I mean. I don't want in any way offend or be insensitive to my Catholic friends in the room Um, But I don't see anywhere in scripture where Mary is any more than a human mother. I don't see where she is part deity or supernatural, anything like that. I don't see where if I pray to her, then miracles will start happening in my life. And again, I don't want to be offensive in any way. But when I read about Mary in scripture, she's a mother, just like so many of you are. So when she was pregnant with Jesus in her belly, I bet you anything she couldn't sleep at night because she couldn't get comfortable, right? Right. I bet you anything that she had morning sickness and the food that she so loved that she craved now just makes her want to puke. Some of you guys are like, what are you talking about? Listen, don't even ask a woman, okay? Just just leave it there, all right? And I bet you when Jesus was finally born over the next couple of weeks, she didn't get a wink of sleep because he wakes up like eight times every night and needs to feed again. But she's a mother. And then later on in life, when Jesus would fall down and scrape his knee, I bet you anything, she ran up to him and said, what happened? Let me take care of that, right? And when Jesus at 12 years old is in Jerusalem and he gets lost because he's in the temple teaching a bunch of people about about God and truth and Mary and Joseph, they're on their way back to Nazareth in this caravan. They realize that Jesus isn't with them. So they rush back to Jerusalem to try to find Jesus. She's in a panic. And why wouldn't she be? Her son, 12 years old, is lost in this monster city. She's a mother. So check this out. How do you think she's feeling when she's watching her son suffer on the cross? I mean, forget about the theological implications of what he's doing. This is her son. And the pain she's experiencing. I mean, as a parent, 
when your kids are hurting, you will do anything you can to take their place. And if there is a way that Mary could switch places with her son Jesus on the cross, she would have done it in a heartbeat. Jesus sees her pain. Watch this. He takes his focus off the grand picture and steps into her pain. And he gives her hope there. You know, this is a pattern of Jesus all throughout Scripture. I mean, there are times where Jesus, for example, Jesus is teaching to this group of really important people you know, like scholars and teachers and stuff. And he's talking about like faith and things like this. And then all of a sudden a group of kids sees Jesus and because he's a kid magnet, they just run up to him like kids do, right? Now you gotta understand in that culture and in that day, kids weren't as valuable as adults. Why? Because kids only consumed from the culture, but never really contributed to the culture. So they're kind of like second rate citizens. So these kids rush up to Jesus because they love him. He's like the one person who actually gets on their level and notices them. But here's the thing. The disciples kind of act like Jesus bouncer at this point. And when they see these kids run up, they're like, no, 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 no. Wait, Jesus is busy doing really, really important things right now. You know what Jesus does? He's like, what in the world are you guys doing? Don't stop them from coming. Let the kids come to me. And this is what he says, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. It's theirs. In fact, here's some homework, guys. Whenever you read through the Gospels again, notice how often Jesus stops mid-schedule, mid-plan, and steps into somebody else's pain or brokenness. Now, this is going to mess with some of you theologically. This is going to freak some of you out. Because like, whoa, whoa, God is sovereign. Well, he is. And he never lets anything stop him from accomplishing his plan. And he wouldn't let anything thwart this eternal redemptive process he put in place. Nothing will get in his way. And I don't necessarily disagree with you, but then I can't help interpreting some of the things I see with like, wait a minute. He stopped what he was doing and focused on this person's pain. But if you think about it, guys, what's the point of redemption in the first place? The whole point of redemption was to step into the brokenness of creation, ourselves included, enter our pain on the cross and set us free from sin. So if he can do that on a macro basis, a universal basis, why can't he show us glimpses of that in micro scenarios? Guys, this is good news for us because it means Jesus notices us He understands our pain. He understands our brokenness. He understands our confusion. And he will stop everything to step into that and give us hope. In fact, check this out. The very first miracle Jesus did, this is his motivation. Now, let me, this is where I'm going to take you to John chapter 2, okay? John chapter 2, it, it's called the, the miracle at the wedding in Cana. So Cana is kind of like a town in this place called Galilee. It's kind of like a state in the country of Israel. So it's like Fort Wayne, Indiana, United States. There it is. So there's a wedding feast happening in this town called Cana. And Jesus and his disciples are invited to this wedding So is his mother, Mary. At one point, here's the problem, guys. The family runs out of wine. In fact, if you look at chapter two, verse one and two, here's what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, here's what you need to understand. For some of you at your wedding, some, maybe perhaps the wine or the refreshments or the snacks ran out and that's like a bad wedding, right? But I mean, that's like nothing compared to if it happened back in this day because in that culture, wine represented life. And if you run out of wine at a wedding feast, which wasn't a couple of hour affair like it is for us, it was a week long party. Oh my goodness. If you ran out of wine before the end of the party, that was a bad omen, almost bad luck. Like this marriage is doomed to fail. This is really bad. It would bring shame on the family and on the wedding party. This is not good. So Mary, watch this, goes to Jesus and he says, she says the, they've run out of wine. In other words, Jesus, you got to do something about this. Now, watch what Jesus says. Dear woman, why do you involve me? 
Now, some of you are like, that sounds rude. Did he just call his mother woman? Listen, if I called my mother woman, <laughs> it's not going to turn out so well. Actually, he's not being rude at all. He's being very respectful because in that day, it was almost saying, ma'am, it was a term of respect, to be honest with you. Ma'am, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not come. Now, when you read that, doesn't it kind of feel like Jesus is being insensitive? It's like, Jesus, look, there's a big problem right here. And of everybody here, you can do something about it. But Jesus is like, uh, nope, sorry, not my time. Because here's the thing, woman, I've got my mind on this big picture, right? And I've got a schedule to keep. I know what I'm here to do. And I know when it's supposed to be triggered. I'm going to the cross one day and three days later, I'll rise from the dead, conquering sin, the grave and death itself. But that's got to happen in a pretty tight timeline, man. So it hasn't started yet. I can't really help you. Sounds a little bit rude, right? Almost like God's too busy focusing on the big picture. He doesn't have time for our small problem. But look at verse five. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So now I'm confused. I'm like, wait, what happened? In verse four, he says, I don't have time for this. In verse five, Mary says, do whatever he tells you to do. He's going to take care of this. Something happened between verse four and five to convince Jesus, I'm going to get involved in this. Well, no, let me say it a different way. I'm going to step out of the big picture, break my timeline to step into the micro. I'm asking the question, what happened? What motivated him to do this? Now, there are a few options that we could talk about. One of them is that wine represented life, right? And so as Jesus turned water into wine, he was showing that he can create new life, which of course is a precursor, a preamble to what he would do on the cross and the resurrection for us. He would give us new life. But guys, here. Nobody knew that. None of them are thinking that. I promise you, when they brought out this brand new wine and the master of the banquet tasted it and they took the first sip, I promise you, nobody said, oh, I see what Jesus is doing here. I get it. Okay, he's going to three years from now, he's, he's going to die on the cross. He's going to give me new life and I'm going to become a new creation if I put my faith in him. Nobody's thinking this. So even though that might be true, Nobody else would have known this. Now, there's another option on this too. It's, it's, you know what? It's Jesus did this to protect this family from the inevitable shame that would come from running out of wine. But they didn't know what Jesus did. In fact, keep reading. Watch what happens. This is verse six. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. And now listen to what he says. He says, Everyone, stop what you're doing and pay attention. This guy must be the son of God because he turned water into wine. And oh my goodness, are you privileged to be in his presence? He doesn't say that. Watch what he says. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Watch this. The master of the banquet had no idea where the wine came from. He had no idea there was a miracle there. All he thought was, wow, this family's tricky. They must have had like a big old store of wine that nobody knew about. And they're just bringing out the best wine afterwards. So check this out. The only people who knew that Jesus did a miracle there was watch this. Jesus, his disciples, his mother, and a couple of servants. Call it 20 people. That's it. So did Jesus do this for the wedding party? Sure he did, but they had no idea there was a problem in the first place. And they had no idea what he did. Now, if you keep reading, 
Watch what it says. This is the first, this, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. So now I'm asking, okay, maybe that was the motivation. Maybe it was so that his disciples could initially put their faith in him. But I struggle with that one too, because guys, listen to me. It, if I were Jesus and I wanted to reveal my glory, I could think of better ideas than this. I mean, think about it. Think about some of the other miracles Jesus did after this. I mean, the dude stopped the storm in his tracks. He's there on a boat with the disciples. The storm shows up about to capsize the boat. He gets up, looks at the storm and says, all right, calm down, okay? And the storm stops. That's a pretty impressive miracle. Maybe I would choose to raise somebody back to life who just died, like he did with Lazarus. I mean, that would be impressive. That would reveal glory, or even better, watch this. If I'm preaching to a crowd of 5,000 people plus women and children and they all get hungry and all I've got is five loaves of bread and two small fish and all of a sudden I turn all of that into enough food to feed every one of them, I might choose that miracle to reveal my glory because a lot of people would see it, right? And all of those miracles I think would do more to have the disciples put their faith in Jesus than just turning some water to wine. So I I don't know if that's the true motivation either, but guys, I think there's a fourth one that I've kind of landed on. I think he did this for one person, his mother. Let's track with me here. 30 years before this, the then teenage Mary was visited by an angel who said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will give birth to a son. And you will call him Jesus for you. Save the people from their sins. In other words, you will be pregnant with the Son of God, the Savior of the world. The Bible says that Jesus treasured all these things in her heart. And she said, Jesus, if the, or Lord, if this is your will, I'm all in. And then she would watch Jesus grow up. But as you read the Gospels, there are indications that Mary started to doubt who Jesus really is. Maybe it was just a dream. It happened so many years ago. Did I in, misinterpret what the angel said? Is Jesus really the son of God, the savior of the world, like the angel told me? And I think she's doubting. So watch this. When the wedding at Cana happens and they run out of wine, she goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, can you do something about this? I think she's asking this less for the family and more for herself because she's experiencing a crisis of faith. Is Jesus really the son of God? Is he the savior? Watch what happens. I think Jesus stepped out of his schedule and into his mother's crisis of faith for her sake. Oh man, that's good news. There's, there's a lesson in all of this, guys. It's, I think because Mary was important to Jesus, so was her problem. Because we are important to Jesus, so are our problems. Because they were important to Jesus, so were their problems. Because you are important to Jesus, so are your problems. This became very real for me this week. A couple of weeks ago, I get a call from Heather. I'm at work. And, and I knew that day she had some blood work done. And she calls me and says, hey, I got, the, I got the call from the doctor. And I said, oh, great, tell me what happened. She says, well, better that we wait till you get home. I was like, what? So I was in a meeting and I said, meeting's over. And that was the longest 10 minutes uh, drive home I've ever had. So when I get home, she says, well, the doctors called and said that they saw elevated cell activity. And that freaked me out. I mean, I had visions of cancer and so on and so forth. And, and so on the notes that the doctor sent to Heather, it said, you know, it, it, we, we, we need to do a biopsy. And we need to see if what we're seeing is just a simple infection or if it's cancer. Yeah, that's the, like the worst day of my life. 
And so we get online and stuff, we start looking at symptoms and uh, but thankfully the things that apparently cause this kind of cancer, Heather didn't have, but I'm still freaking out. And so of course I start to pray and a thought occurred to me, a thought occurred to me. You know, there's a, uh, there are so many people who have actual cancer and man, they're suffering through it. I mean, I mean, we've been praying for Coach Davidson at Blackhawk Christian and there's the, the battle he's going through. You know, there are people who are starving out there and there are people who they've lost their marriage, they've lost their kids, they're stuck in an addiction. Like, man, those are really big problems. And the thought occurred to me, you know what? It's this, I mean, we don't even know if it's cancer. Maybe it's just a small infection. So the thought said, you know, maybe you shouldn't be so concerned about this. In other words, maybe you shouldn't have make it this big of a deal before God. And then I heard uh, God say, you know what? Um, uh, everyone has problems and their problems may to you seem bigger than your problems, but this is your problem. And if you let me, I'll step into your problem and bring you hope too. So we had a, a doctor's appointment on Thursday and they did a biopsy. And while they were looking, they found a little tiny spot. And all of a sudden my fears jump up again. So we get online and we're like, what could this spot be? And we'll find out this week. Um, but all week we've been praying um, as you would pray. And I think when I saw that Jesus, because I'm important to him, because Heather's important to him, so is our problem. And I'm just grateful that I've got a God and a savior who's willing to take his attention off the grand master vision and plan and schedule and step into my problem. And he will do this for you. And there's a way that you can do this in a very practical way right now. Brookside has partnered with a ministry called 410 Ministries. And it's a ministry primarily to young women who are caught up in the human trafficking and sex industry, the sex slave industry. And some of the things that they do is they go into strip clubs, just women, they go into strip clubs, they minister and build relationships with the dancers in hopes of giving them Jesus and then helping them find freedom. One of the things that 410 Ministries has done is actually partnered up with the FBI and the Indiana State Police. And as these women and even boys are rescued, watch this, the FBI connects them to 410 Ministries who can then have longer term care and provision for them. And so we talked with 410 Ministries and we said, you know, what do you need? And they said, listen, here's what the FBI tells us they need. They need 17 duffel bags. These are from Vera Bradley, I think. Yeah, very Bradley. I don't know, is that good? <laughs> are these like expensive or something? They need 17 bags for 17 kids. Um, and this will be, once they are filled, the only possessions of these kids as soon as they're rescued. And this is our way, right now at least, of stepping into some people's pain and giving them the hope and love of Jesus. So here's what I want you to do, guys. I have my phone right here, and if you wouldn't mind pulling up the Brookside Church app, I just want to tell you what you can do to be a part of this. We've got a couple of options for you, but as I open up my Brookside Church app, I noticed that the third icon down, there's a title that says, get a bag for someone, right? So why don't you go ahead and click on that. It says, help fill a bag. Here's a couple of things that you can do, all right? Um, you can decide to just simply donate some money so that we can help fill these bags, or you can get a list of everything that is needed in the bag. I mean, I'm not talking about like big expensive things like deodorant shampoo, a blanket, some sweatshirts, these kinds of things to fill a bag. This is what Heather and I are gonna do. We're gonna take our kids and when they ask, why are you buying deodorant for someone you don't even know? Well, it's a ministry opportunity, isn't it? 
And here's what you can do, all right? And so there's a thing that support this opportunity financially by buying a bag or making a one-time gift to 410 Ministries. When you click there, it's gonna take you to part of our website where you can donate some things. One of these bags completely filled is about 210 bucks. And if you want to, you can do a one-time gift of 210 and we'll fill it and you can be a part of this. Or if you wanna go back to the main page, um, you can see a list of everything that they need. And this is the list from the FBI and the state police, like a small blanket or throw, a water bottle, blank journal, stuffed animals, stuffed animals. Who do you think is then stuck in the sex industry if they need a stuffed animal? And what you can do is actually we made links for you. So you don't even have to go anywhere. You can click on the link and buy it right there on Amazon. And then we're going to ask you to do this and be a part of this for the next couple of weeks, this week and next week. Um, donate anytime you want to. Whenever the 17 bags are filled, we're going to give them to the FBI and the state police through 410 Ministries. But if there's any donations in excess of this, we're going to give it to 410 Ministries so that they can just continue helping kids, boys and girls stuck in the sex trafficking industry. What they say they need is four boys bags right now and 13 girl bags. So my family's gonna do this and I really hope that you will as well. Um, and any questions, I'm gonna encourage you to call the church and ask questions and let's do this together. I mean, when, when, when we saw the number 17, we're like, this is Brookside. We can give more than 17 bags. You know what the answer was? No, we can only have 17 bags. That's all the storage we have at the FBI headquarters right now. I'm like, what? We don't need to stop at 17 bags. We'll just continue to bless 410 ministries, all right? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing you've given us and we're so grateful for your grace. We're so grateful that you loved us so much to step into our pain, step into our brokenness, whatever that is, whatever, no matter how small it feels it is compared to somebody else's problems or this big master plan of salvation, you loved us so much that you were willing to care for us in our problems and our pain. And so may we invite you in and may we watch you work. We pray for 410 Ministries as they minister to these girls and boys being rescued out of the human trafficking and sex slave industry and ask that you will help Brookside provide for them. For anybody who's never yet said yes to you today, I pray that they will make the decision to call you Lord and Savior as they recognize you as their sin bearer. Take all of their sin and shame and pour it on yourself for their salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.
Guys, you know what the cool thing about the story of Mary is, um, you know, I mentioned the, the fact that at the crucifixion, Jesus' other four brothers were not there because a lot of historians and commentators believe that they weren't even believers in Jesus yet. One of his brothers is named James. He will eventually write the book of James and become one of the greatest pillars of the early church. The question I'm asking is, how did James go from a jealous brother who didn't believe in Jesus to being a pillar in the new faith that Jesus was Lord of? I think, I think what happened is that Mary, after Jesus died, converted her other sons to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. And now I'm beginning to see how when Jesus enters our micro brokenness that might not matter, he blows it up into massive impact. And so my prayer for you is that you will have the courage to invite Jesus into whatever pain or brokenness you have and just watch him go to work. Thank you guys for being with us. We love you guys. We can't wait to see you next week as we approach Easter. Bring your family, your friends, your neighbors. Just drive up and say, get in the car. We're going, okay? And so we'll see you next week. Have a